Hello everyone, this is Humayun Aryan. Welcome and thank you for joining us again. It's great to have you all. It's great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Shasha Zhao from the University of Michigan. Shasha received her bachelor's degree in 2004 from the University of Science and Technology of China. She then completed her PhD in 2009 at UCLA. Her general research interest is to study the dynamic interaction between the solar wind, magnetosphere, and ionosphere thermosphere as a coupled system. In particular, how the coupled ionosphere thermosphere system responds to magnetospheric drivers and regulates magnetospheric processes during geomagnetic disturbances. Recently, her research has been focusing on the formation, evolution, and scintillation impact of multi-scale ionospheric density structures, such as storm-enhanced density, polar cap patch, and equatorial plasma bubble. Dr. Zhao has received many awards, notably the International Union of Radio Science Young Scientists Award and the Ted Kennedy Family Faculty Team Excellence Award. Currently, she's an associate professor at the Department of Climate and Space Sciences and Engineering at the University of Michigan. Today, she will discuss multi-scale ionosphere response during geomagnetic storms, looking at observations, modeling, and machine learning. Before she starts, we would like to remind you this presentation is recorded, so please keep your microphones muted. If you have questions, send them to the chat box or send them directly to myself. Uh, Dr. Zhao, thank you for accepting our invitation. Please go ahead when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much, Hamayan, for the nice introduction. So first, uh, I would like to thank the uh, conveners of this uh, uh, magnetosphere seminar series. You know, this really provides us an opportunity of share our work and to, you know, discuss with uh, colleagues during this really unprecedented um, situation. Um, so in today's uh, presentation, um, I want to talk about uh, Earth's magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere coupling with an emphasis on the multi-scale ionospheric response during storm time. I will talk about um, multi-instrument observations, uh, numerical simulations, as well as machine learnings. Um, Before we talk about the details of the ionosphere, we have to zoom out first to put our ionosphere uh, inside the magnetic field bubble of the Earth. Uh, because of the geometry of the Earth, um, the high latitude ionosphere is very sensitive to the solar wind magnetosphere interactions, as well as uh, the magnetospheric dynamics in the tail region. So in order to understand the ionosphere response, we have to understand the whole geospace system dynamics. Now, if we only have the solar EUV as the energy uh, source, most of the IT dynamics would occur in the equatorial and the low latitude regions, mainly driven uh, by the solar heated uh, thermosphere. Adding the solar wind forcing can create various of high latitude dynamics, including the uh, two cell convection patterns you see here, the field line currents, and our aurora zone. So during the quiet times, the high latitude and the low latitude regions, they uh, basically separate, they don't interact with each other very strongly. But both the solar wind and uh, the solar UV are highly variable and create you know, geomagnetic disturbances or space weather events. So when the energy input into the geospace system increases and both the high latitude and the low latitude system will expand and uh, very interesting phenomena will occur at the interface in the mid latitude regions uh, due to the expansion of those two systems. And so in today's uh, um, presentation, I will highlight some of the features that's emerging during this, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, interaction regions between the high and the low latitude region. So the geospace system is quite complicated, you know, really depending on what physical parameters you like to play with, and you might 
uh, have your own, uh, you know, best pictures picking from this uh, um, summary plot. Like for this presentation, we will highlight on the ionospheric uh, density or the plasma content. And so that's showing here. And uh, uh, you will see that in order to actually understand this multi-scale ionospheric structure, we have to look at the other parameters as well. We need to look at the currents. We need to look at the thermospheric wind, the convection patterns, and the compositions. So the density really provide us a way of poking into this complex uh, system. So the talk today will be separated into two sections. The first part, I will talk about observation and a numerical modeling of storm enhanced density, which is the largest scale structure and the polar cap patches, and that's a mesoscale scale structure. In the second part of this talk, I will move on to talk about the specification and the forecasting of ionospheric PEC use uh, uh, machine learning techniques. So first I'm gonna talk about the storm enhanced density or SED formation. So the SED is actually part of the ionosphere positive phase. And uh, um, the ionosphere positive phase is uh, the first phase of the ionosphere storm response. So uh, based on uh, earlier observations, and people have found that the ionosphere density or the plasma content can actually either increase or decrease comparing with quiet times during a geomagnetic storm. And so uh, recently, you know, really benefited from the uh, global scale uh, total electron content or TEC observations uh, from those worldwide uh, the GNSS receivers. Here, the GNSS refers to the global navigation satellite systems. And so with thousands of those ground-based receivers available, we now have an opportunity of monitoring the ionosphere plasma content on a global scale. So this availability renewed our interest in studying the ionosphere response during geomagnetic storms. The map here shown on the right is uh, a uh, from our recent developed model called VISTA. I will talk about the details later. But as you can see during a geomagnetic storm, you can see dramatic plasma content changes you know, uh, in, the, um, in this particular case in the Northern Hemisphere. Besides uh, the TEC from the GNSS network, we also have other type of uh, distributed observational networks, such as uh, convection flows from Superdome and uh, the fuel line currents inferred from the uh, Iridium satellite constellation or the Ampere project. So those three distributed observational network really provide us a way of looking at the uh, large scale picture of the geospace system and how they respond to uh, uh, space weather events. Now, another type of uh, uh, data that I'm going to show today is from the ground-based incoherent scatter radars. And those are the very powerful ground-based instrument that can measure multiple ionospheric parameters. So providing us a way of, you know, diagnose the plasma uh, using uh, those in situ or uh, actually remote sensing techniques. So uh, here I'm showing you uh, several ISRs located in the Northern Hemisphere. The data set will be used today, including uh, the poker flat incoherent scatter radar and uh, the Resolute Bay ISR and the Sandra Storm ISRs. So combine those uh, global scale observational network and with uh, the localized observations, we have a way to uh, measure the multi-scale, multi-parameter of uh, the ionosphere, thermosphere um, evolutions. Now, this is a nice picture uh, of uh, the TEC map in the Northern Hemisphere, highlighting the storm enhanced the density structure. We typically call this uh, mid-latitude, the much larger TEC increase as uh, the SED base region. And as you can see, this high TECs can also transport into the uh, polar cap regions or sometimes can even return back to the day site, okay, to finish the complete downgy cycle. 
So when those plasma get into the higher latitude regions, we start to call them uh, uh, SED plumes. And if they can be segmented into even smaller scales, we um, now call them polar cap patches. And I will talk about polar cap patches later. So if you put one of the ISRs underneath this uh, red pixels, you will see that uh, the ionosphere F region and topside ionosphere density uh, actually significantly increased. And uh, the peak height is uh, lifted from the quiet location 100 or even 200 kilometers above. So this significant vertical lifting within SED is evident in all the SED uh, studies that we have uh, performed. And it is also critical for us to understand the formation of the SED. So now I wanna spend some time to talk about the background fundamental physics. Uh, why should we care about the strong lifting, right? And what conditions will create a lifting? Now, if you think about the magnetic field geometries, this one shows in the northern hemisphere, right? Uh, here is from low to high latitude regions. We have this magnetic field that is not purely vertical, except deep in the polar regions. And so the E cross B convection flows, in this case, um, is perpendicular to the magnetic field. And you can see it will have a component that's projected into the vertical direction. So this E cross B convection flows can either lift or descend the ionosphere F region and topside uh, ionosphere plasma. Besides the convection flows, the marine neutral wind can also push the plasma up or down along the magnetic fields. Now, think about an equatorial meridiana wind in this case. Due to the ion neutral collisions, the wind can push the plasma move along the magnetic field. In this case, it's moving upward. And so you can see it also has a projection, um, positive projection in the vertical direction. So both the convection flows and uh, the meridiana wind can affect the altitude of the ionosphere F layer. This type of uh, configuration can be generalized to any um, or vertical forces. So in reality, in the ionosphere, the total plasma drift speed is determined by the convection, the marine neutral wind, and also the ambipolar diffusion. And in this ambipolar diffusion terms, we have the uh, gravitational force and the pressure gradient force included there. So the total drift is determined by all of those parameters. We can further look at uh, the convection impact. So the left panel here shows uh, uh, in the inertia reference frame that the convection flows uh, together with the co-rotation. This determines the plasma trajectories in the F region. And those trajectories can actually be separated into two directions, the horizontal and the vertical directions. The vertical direction drift is uh, uh, more important here. So when we have southward IMF, the vertical drift is in general upward on the day side and then downward on the night side. So you can think about when the plasmas are transported by the convection flows into the higher latitude region, they get uplifted on the day side and then they will uh, descend on the night side. Um, and this type of uplifting and descending forces will enhance during geomagnetic storm time. Now we understand that the ionosphere can actually be uh, lifted up or descend to lower altitude. Then why it matters, right? So now we have to think about the major chemical reactions that's happening in the F region. So the major ion component in the F region is the O plus. And the loss of O plus in the F region is through a, a two-step process. The first step is this O plus will charge exchange with the surrounding uh, molecular species. And the product of this charge exchange will then recombine with the ambient electrons. And so this two-step process is mainly controlled by the speed of the first one here. And as you can see, if we can move the ionosphere up and down, 
they can either move uh, away from the denser neutrals or towards the denser neutrals. So that will create um, a, a, way, a way of either uh, reduce the loss rate or increase the loss rate, right? So combine the drift and also the chemical reactions together. Now we look at uh, the SED formation mechanism called the imbalance between the production and the loss. If on the day side in the sunlit region, we still have uh, the solar production going on, so we are constantly creating a, a fresh plasma. But at the same time, if we can lift the plasma away from the neutrals, we can uh, increase their lifetime and reduce loss. So in this way, we can have the total electron content increase in the ionosphere. So the key thing here is to find out where and under what conditions those lifting forces is a major uh, contributor, right? So in order to find that, we will have to find a way to either measure the perpendicular drift and uh, at the same time to measure the field aligned uh, drift. So in order to do that, we combine the larger scale, the TEC map with localized measurement from uh, the poker flat incoherent scatter radars this uh, advanced modular incoherent scanner radar can nearly simultaneously measure the plasma drift at various directions in the ionosphere. So we find those SED cases and also those fortuitous cases where ISRs are actually right underneath them. Uh, for example, in this case, the Plasma diagnostics provided by Pfizer is located near the SED base region. So in the SED base, we very often see that the vertical lifting is many due to the penetration electric field and the enhanced convections. And the field aligned component occasionally contribute positively uh, during this case, but uh, the most important lifting force is the E cross B forces, and in particular, the northward component. If we're following the SED plasma now from the base into the plume region, um, within the plume region, you know, uh, if we can have uh, continued enhanced convections, it may still push the plasmas to higher altitude. But unfortunately, this is also often the location where the uh, field aligned component becomes negative. So they start to push the plasma downward. The final vertical drift will depending on which component is stronger. So in, um, after we summarize all the SED events that we have observed, we found that you know, there can be many different kind of combinations between the uh, convection and the field aligned component. And that determines the dynamics and the evolution of the SED and the plume. So once the, the SED plasma is created on the day side due to the solar production and during their transport through the polar region to the night side, they will experience this type of roller coaster ride, you know, uh, frequent up, uh, upper lifting and then uh, downward descending force. And it is mainly due to the dynamic interaction between the convection and the thermospheric wind. To look at more quantitatively how those SEDs are formed and then performed during different uh, uh, IMF conditions. And then we turn to use uh, the advanced numerical simulations and so um, here I want to introduce the space weather modeling framework. And many of you are actually quite familiar with this uh, uh, framework. So there are a dozen of uh, components in this framework use uh, uh, various physical models to describe the dynamics of the sun and the earth systems. Now, in the next uh, a couple of slides, I will show you the uh, results from the global ionosphere thermosphere model developed by my colleague, Aaron Ridley. 
To study a geomagnetic storm that uh, happened back in 2010, we used the, the GITM simulations and driven by two empirical models, the Weimar convection model and the Ovation Aurora model. So uh, we see this plume formation and extending to the polar cap regions. We can actually uh, select the plasma columns that's within the simulation regime and then trace them backwards to find out where they are come from and to find out when the plasmas that's transferred to the polar region and what type of forces they experienced. So uh, for example, we tested the sensitivity of the SED plasma vertical profiles to the convection changes. And so um, the first row here shows after the southward turning, we see the lifting of the African ionosphere and the topside ionosphere density increase significantly. And this increase is mainly due to this vertical transport, you know, um, by pushing the plasma to higher altitudes. And then we can still have some um, production going on. And in this case, we may still have the SED, the TEC com um, content increase in the column. The bottom row here shows uh, what happens after the northward turning. So you can see a very rapid descending of the F layer. Now there is nothing holding um, this uh, lifted uh, denser plasma, right? So due to the pressure gradient and gravitational force, and they will start to um, move downward towards the denser neutral. And now in this uh, um, denser neutral regime, the chemical loss plays a very important role to move to remove the plasmas from the simulation domain. In this study, we also found that actually plasma from both the dusk and the dawn sectors can contribute to the SED formation. But what's important is that we found they can have very different ionosphere average and peak height and then peak density. So the plasma that's coming from the dawn sectors, they experience a much uh, smoother ride. You know, uh, the uh, peak height of the F layer gradually increase after the IMF southward turning, and also the peak density increases ver uh, gradually. The plasma that's coming from the dusk side can experience some of the largest lifting forces, and then the total electron content can increase in that way, but it's also very sensitive to uh, the descending force after the IMF turn to northward. And so using the numerical simulations, we can find out the source of those SED plasmas and uh, um, what they have experienced while they move um, from the lower latitude to the polar cap regions. Now, back in 2012, the Lua et al. study used time GCM also quantified the different contributions of the convection electric field and the marine diana wind to the uh, vertical plasma lift. So what they found is during the early main phase, the um, convection lifting is very important in the low latitude regions and in the sub zone. This is consistent with our observations. And then later in the main phase or the recovery phase, the meridiano wind now starts to move equatorward and they can also lift the ionosphere to higher latitude. And so from those numerical studies, we see that during different time at different locations, the convection and the wind can contribute differently to this vertical lifting. The storms that we have studied previously are all intense or um, moderate geomagnetic storms. During super storms, um, the plasma from the expanded ectoral ionization anomaly region may also contribute to the formation of the SED plumes. And so here is an example from uh, the semi 3 simulations uh, for a study where the DSD is almost minus 400 nanotesla. So in those type of very strong storms, we start to see the plasma really form this global scale uh, circulations, you know, from the low and the equatorial latitude regions to the high latitude regions, and may eventually actually return back to the day site after complete the downgy cycle. So next, I'm gonna switch to the polar cap patches, which is a, a one type of the mesoscale ionosphere structures we see. 
So this is what the polar cap patch looks like in the TEC map. And you can see a blob of high density plasmas in the um, polar regions and compare with the surrounding relatively low density background. If we have an ISRs right underneath those pixels, this is what we will see. There are actually um, those uh, uh, elongated plasma structures, you know, in the vertical direction. And uh, there are very large density gradients uh, near those polar cap patches. Because of those uh, gradients, there can be uh, ionospheric irregularities and then scintillations that's happening associated with the polar cap patch. And so those patches are the major space weather threats in the polar, deep polar cap that can lead to the ionospheric scintillations. Now the formation mechanism or the segmentation mechanism of the polar cap patches um, have been studied by many people and there are various of formation mechanisms proposed. Many of those formation mechanisms would uh, uh, invoke a transient um, IMF or solar wind dynamic pressure variations. And so the segmentation happens here near the daylight dusk regions. In terms of the high density plasma source, the SED plume is proposed as one of those high density plasma source. And the other source is uh, uh, due to the soft electron precipitations in the cusp region and increases the ionization in that region. So in order to find which uh, plasma source is the most important thing, we need to measure the plasma characteristics right uh, within the polar cap patch. Okay, so using the ISRs at a, a Resolute Bay, um, a Jiang Zhen, a graduate student in the group, have conducted a statistical analysis. He automatically identifies all the polar cap patches and the width, the half width of the patch. And then he superposed those uh, uh, polar cap patches at different sectors. For example, the top row shows uh, uh, the average uh, properties in the noon sector. The blue curve shows the patch and then the red curve shows uh, the average condition in the surrounding region. The bottom here shows uh, uh, the conditions in the midnight sector. So compare those two rows, you can see very clearly the patch is denser and that's the definition, right? But what's also interesting is that in the day side, we also see that the patch is actually much cooler than the surrounding region by three or 400 Kelvin. So this uh, denser and cooler temperature than the surrounding region demonstrated that the solar produced SED plume is the major source, the plasma source for the polar cap patches. Uh, we occasionally see the hotter patches and those uh, should be due to the particle precipitations, but on average, their occurrence rate is much lower than the colder or the traditional patches. Now to simulate the segmentation of the polar cap patch, uh, we need to use uh, um, more modules from the space weather modeling framework in order to catch the dynamics that's happening in the magnetosphere. So we use uh, the Bethra S MHD models coupled with uh, the, uh, the RIM ionospheric electrodynamics module and also the um, inner magnetosphere module. The output from those coupled two-way coupled modules are then used to drive the global ionosphere and thermosphere model. So next I'm gonna use the September 2017 uh, storm as an example to show you how we utilize those numerical models to understand the segmentation of patch. And uh, this storm has attracted a lot of attention in the community. It is a, a pretty surprising, you know, double deep storm that's happened near the solar minimum of solar cycle 24. Um, so in this case, the Gidon resolution uh, that we use is one degree latitude by two degree longitude. And for the Bethlehem MHD, uh, in order to capture the mesoscale dynamics that's important for the patch segmentation, we use the one eighth of RE resolution um, in the nearest region from plus or minus 15 RE. So 
uh, several million cells are used in this uh, simulation. Now, the period we focus on uh, during this uh, initial steady IMF software uh, period, the IMF BZ uh, was around minus 10 nanotesla, and it has been steady for uh, quite a few hours. Give us a very nice opportunity to study how the system responds during steady IMF conditions. Now, this is a quite busy plot. So I'm going to walk you actually from the bottom and uh, upward. So after the IMF southward turning during that steady IMF uh, conditions, we gradually see the development and uh, the evolution of the partial ring current in the uh, magnetosphere in the equatorial plane. So at the same time, um, the penetration Sasha, I think you're muted. Okay. So you guys cannot hear me? Yes, we can now hear we you can. now. Now we yeah, can hear you. Mm -hmm. Did I mute from the beginning or just now? Maybe you can start from the beginning of this slide again. Yeah, everything was good just until just now. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. OK. So I'm going to talk about this slide again. OK. So this is a very busy plot. I'm going to walk you through from the bottom and all the way up. So after the IMF southward turning, we see that the ring current in, uh, gradually develops in the equatorial region. And this is uh, the plasma pressure in the equatorial plane. What we see also in the ionosphere is uh, the strong penetration electric field into the mid latitude and the low latitude regions. And this penetration electric field gives you this polar word component. Remember that polar word component is the major lifting force for the ionosphere, right? So indeed, we see the Afrigen plasma starts to uh, increase in the Gideon uh, Afrigen of 350 kilometers. Later, when the ring current is strong enough, the magnetic gradient drift of those energetic particles will gradually move towards the day side. And uh, at the same time, the shielding will develop. So you will start to see more of those eco potentials now will close in the middle between the region two downward and the region one upper field line currents. So those convection flows are called the boundary flows. The boundary flows, when they are uh, large enough, they will increase the frictional heating in the ionosphere and now starts to reduce the plasma. So here we are seeing this uh, two-phased response after the uh, strong uh, IMF southward turning and the convection increase. Now, this was a study performed by a graduate student, Han Wang, in the group. He looked at uh, all the details that's within this plasma um, you know, uh, columns. He traced the plasma columns in the boundary flow and backwards to find out where they are from. So you can see the locations back in the earlier times. What do we see um, from the Gideon simulation is that this type of segmentation mechanism uh, is important when the Afrigen plasma is somewhere around 300 kilometer ish. So that means this plasma has not been lifted very significantly. Because the Afrigen plasma hasn't been lifted very significantly, the um, frictional heating or the frequent collide with uh, the neutrals can become uh, very uh, efficient to increase the ion temperature and therefore the charge exchange chemical reactions that I mentioned to you will increase and then reduce the electron uh, densities. So in this way, we first uh, lift the ionosphere, but not too significantly. It's very important to know that. And then during the second decaying phase, the enhanced frictional heating will gradually eaten this F region. So in this case, the, uh, the polar cap patch is now segmented. 
So in this new SED segmentation method, um, there is no uh, transient IMF or solar wind condition changes. And the segmentation is purely due to internal dynamics. In this particular case, the westward drifting of the partial ring current. I emphasize that it's very important to understand that plasma hasn't been uplifted very significantly, right? And so um, the reason is that in other cases, when this plasma uh, getting into the segmentation region, if the F layer has been lifted to very high altitude uh, in a different storm, in this case, we're seeing them lifted to about uh, 500 kilometers. So in this case, the frictional heating is not uh, sufficient or not fast enough to remove the plasmas from that uh, polar cap patch. In this case, we're actually seeing that the transport of the relatively low density plasma in the surrounding region into um, the SED plume region is the mechanism that's actually segmented the polar cap patch. So combine the previous mechanism and this one, we see that the altitude profile of the source plasma is very important to determine which segmentation mechanism is more efficient. Okay, so just a brief summary of this first part. Um, we used the multi-scale ionospheric structuring process um, to study the magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere coupling. I think this is one of the examples that's demonstrating how important it is that we use system science approach to look at those coupled uh, regime. And we looked at the evolution, the formation, evolution of the SED and how the SEDs can be segmented into polar cap patch. We uh, propose a brand new mechanism to segment the patch, uh, which will not invoke uh, sudden IMF or the solar wind dynamic pressure change. So the second part of this seminar, I'm gonna switch to talk about um, use machine learning mechanism to specify and to forecast the ionospheric PEC. This is uh, one uh, task of our SOSTIS drive center, uh, phase one. So for the SOSTIS drive center, we tackle four grand challenges that are facing our halo physics, all the way from the sun, you know, we forecast and simulate the flares and the CMEs, their propagation in the uh, heliosphere uh, or interplanetary uh, space, and how they um, energize or accelerate the energetic particles and eventually study their impact in the geospace system. So the specification and the forecast of ionospheric TEC is one task of this uh, uh, grand challenge four, that's the impact uh, in the geospace system. The ionosphere is the largest uh, naturally occurring error source for the GNSS uh, uh, positioning, navigation, and uh, timing services, um, and also affects you know, a variety of radio community, uh, communication systems. The ionospheric disturbance is highlighted as one of the five major space weather threats in the National Space Weather Strategy and Action Plan. So the specification and the forecasting the ionosphere plasma uh, content and its variability is uh, very important for our modern technological society. Here I'm giving you an example of um, how the ionosphere uh, structures as during storm affect the WAS service. Um, the WAS is short for the wide area augmentation system, which is uh, um, part of the Federal Aviation Administration that's developed to augment the global positioning system. So during this 2011 geomagnetic storm, this was actually just an intense geomagnetic storm, not a superstorm. Now the service coverage is usually looking like this. Red means uh, very good and you should trust the WAS uh, service. And now during this particular storm time, you can see the service was almost completely disabled uh, in the North America sector. So we have uh, looked at the fighter observations that's located right here. So underneath the SED structure, 
what we see is that there is a huge TC gradient that's developed. You know, this is almost the 70 TC unit gradient uh, within uh, around one degree in geomagnetic latitude. So those type of large TC gradient uh, disabled basically the was service during the storm. So this is just one of those examples that highlight how important it is for us to forecast the ionosphere disturbance. Now, initially, when we approach the forecast problem, uh, we turn to use the global ionosphere maps or the GIM maps from the Center for Orbit Determination in Europe, Europe or CODE Center. So CODE is one of the uh, several international GNSS service centers that provide those completed TEC maps. They typically use uh, a few hundred of receivers um, that meet their quality standard and then give us uh, this type of GIM maps every 15 minutes. So in general, those uh, centers use spherical harmonic fittings uh, to complete the map. So in our initial uh, machine learning task, we take advantage of the spherical harmonic coefficients that's published by the code center. Uh, so instead of forecast the full maps, we forecast the 256 spherical harmonic uh, coefficients. The other uh, input data that are used include the uh, FISM uh, EUV fluxes, and we have used uh, a principal component analysis to reduce the 190 um, different wavelengths into uh, one. So we only use the first component after the PCA. And then we used uh, the disturbance storm uh, DST index to represent the geomagnetic uh, disturbance conditions. So all of those input data are put into the long and short-term memories. Uh, was there something? No, I think there was just some noise. You can carry on. Oh, okay. So I saw there's something wrong. Okay. So we use those uh, input data sets into the long and short-term memory um, forecast models and then to forecast the spherical harmonic coefficients in the next two hours. So this was a work done by a visiting uh, graduate student, Lei Liu, um, back last year. Now, after we developed the forecast model, we compare the prediction with the game map uh, distributed by the code center. And then the residual is shown here in the third column. So as you can see, in general, the forecast model actually performed very well. Most of those uh, residuals are within a plus or minus five TEC unit. Now look at this more statistically. Uh, those are showing you the TEC prediction errors for the first hour and the second hour. So in general, we can see this is a very nice and Gaussian distribution centered around zero, means there is no systematic bias. And during quiet times, the root mean square arrow is as low as 1.5 TC unit. Um, and then uh, and uh, for the second hour is somewhere around two TC unit. So those uh, um, validation work demonstrate the developed model performs very well uh, for both quiet and the storm times. During that work, we indeed noticed uh, the limitations of the game maps is that it's a highly smooth map, right? And we don't see the mesoscale structures. So for example, this is uh, uh, the TEC from the magical TEC database. And then we can see a very nice and elongated equatorial plasma bubbles extending all the way to the mid latitude region and even cutting through the storm enhanced density here. But this type of uh, mesoscale structures cannot be captured in the IGS game maps. So we want to develop a, a new TEC map completion method that can preserve the mesoscale TEC structure and also computationally very efficient. So we start with uh, the magical TEC database that's provided by Ansia Coster and her colleagues. They have collected those worldwide GNSS receivers, more than 5,000 of those receivers, uh, from either GPS or the GNOMNOS 
uh, two different satellite um, systems. And the data is one degree in latitude and one degree in longitude every five minutes. The drawback of this is uh, that we have large data gaps over the ocean, right? So um, we have uh, developed a VISTA model. Uh, this was a very um, fruitful collaboration, you know, um, with statisticians, uh, Professor Chen Yang here in the statistics department and a graduate student from both teams. And this is really enabled by the SOSTIS, this type of large projects that uh, we distributed at different departments can meet together regularly and then work on those challenging problems. The model we developed is called VISTA, um, video imputation with soft input, temporal smoothing and uh, auxiliary data. So VISTA can impute a time series of matrices with large amount of missing values and guarantees both spatial smoothness and temporal consistency. This turns out to be a very useful for reconstructing scientific images, including the TEC maps or videos. And so the T temporal smoothing, the magical database, uh, and the spher spherical harmonic fitted maps all put into the soft input softwares, and then we can get the completed TEC maps. So here you can see in the completed TEC map, we are able to um, represent those uh, mesoscale scale structures like the uh, ectoral plasma bubbles. The graduate student, uh, Leo, um, have uh, conducted a numerical experiment. So we started with uh, the IGS completed map and we assume it's a ground truth. We carve out a large chunk of data and say, okay, for this case, we have a big patch that's missing. The uh, off-the-shelf soft input software uh, will only be able to capture the lower rank matrices uh, in the background, um, but with uh, spherical harmonic fittings and temporal smoothing, those two type of uh, uh, terms adding into the soft input, we have a much better way of capturing the structures, you know, even the um, data uh, missing is such a big um, over such a big area. Here are just some more examples of uh, uh, the VISTA results. We apply the VISTA to the magical TEC. This is the magical TEC data. This is a spherical harmonic fitting, and this is a full model output. So you can see that um, VISTA can capture for example, storm time, the bifurcated ectorial ionization anomaly, it can capture the SED plumes and also the ectorial plasma bubbles. Now this type of completed TEC map will have a huge um, you know, impact uh, for our scientific community. We use the TEC maps to remotely sensing magnetospheric dynamics. Um, we can use, uh, for example, like the polar cap patches and it's a, uh, um, you know, evolution in the polar region to infer the global scale convection. Um, we have used the counterpart of the SED plume or project the SED plume into the ectoral planes to study how it may impact the day side reconnection. We have also used the SEDs to track the particle precipitation boundaries on the night side and also the plasma spheric uh, boundary. Um, in the ionosphere during geomagnetic disturbances. So those are just some examples of how we utilize those completed, uh, or I should say utilize the ionosphere TEC database to remotely sensing the magnetospheric dynamics. So here is just uh, another example of the VISTA output, including the global map and a polar view of the Northern hemisphere. So the ongoing tasks uh, we uh, will apply VISTA to all the existing magical TECs uh, data, and then we will release the VISTA TEC maps to the community for the broader use. We believe that this type of database will be very useful for uh, scientific uh, research. Now, uh, we will continue to develop our TEC forecast models, but instead of use the game maps, we will use the VISTA results and we hope that those mesoscale structures that's preserved in the VISTA model will be able to um, reflect in the final forecast model.
So now I'm given the summary and the conclusion for this second part. Um, for the specification and the forecasting of the ionosphere TEC, we have developed a an, uh, long and uh, short-term TEC forecast model based on the code game maps. And then the model performs well when compared with the code um, the game maps. It performs well during both quiet and storm times. We have also developed an innovative TEC map completion method called VISTA. And then uh, the VISTA is based on the soft input uh, matrix completion algorithm, but with uh, a couple of additional terms to represent the temporal smoothing and then to uh, inject the auxiliary data. Like in this particular case, is a spheric harmonic fitted data. Um, in the future, we will release the VISTA uh, TEC maps into the community. And at the same time, we will develop the TEC forecast model, use this uh, new innovative TEC completion method. So I want to end uh, the seminar with uh, the outlook at the GDC, right? We are very excited about uh, the GDC. And uh, um, I believe the GDC mission will provide us uh, really critical observations for us to understand the multi-scale ionospheric response during geomagnetic disturbances. As um, you probably noticed, uh, in order to understand all the physical um, parameters or the mechanism, we will need to measure some of the critical parameters. The thermospheric wind uh, in our previous study was never measured. It was always inferred either from remote sensing using ISR or from our numerical simulations. And so it's very important to have the real measurement of the thermospheric wind together with the other physical parameters to understand how those different terms contribute to the evolution and um, uh, on the dynamics of those ionospheric structures. And so the last one, I want to thank all the students, the former one or the current ones that's in the group, and uh, many of my collaborators over the years. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shasha. That was a very good talk, very detailed and clear. We do have some questions, but before I do the questions and give everybody a chance to type their questions if they have any. Sure. Um, I would like to remind everyone that next week we have Alex Glosser from NASA Goddard discussing the magnetosphere ionosphere couplings. So please do join us next week. Um, and we go to the questions I have here. Uh, the first question is from Eric on slide 28. If you could go back, please. This one here? Uh, I think so, yeah. So the question is, having a cooler dense plasma as on the day side makes sense from a pressure balance point of view, but there appears to be no significant temperature difference between polar cap patches and the background plasma near midnight. Do you have, or do you know why this is the case? Yes. And so um, if you compare the day side and the night side, you will see also the night side polar cap patches, the density have uh, reduced significantly. Um, that's one thing. And also when the patch is transported from the day side to the night side, it will experience uh, uh, many particle precipitations like from the polar rain and also later in the night side aurora zone. So I think those type of uh, particle precipitations can be a heating source for the patches on the night side. And that gradually reduced the difference between the patch and the surrounding region temperature. Okay, thank you. So if I heard correctly, the model is not public yet, right? Uh, we have a question from Sylvian who wants to know if the tech model is public. This model? The, uh, the Medvigal. Medvigal, yes. Uh, the magical data is publicly available. And so we obtained the magical data from the magical database. The VISTA model right now, uh, we just developed this VISTA model actually at the end of last year. And now, um, you know, the manuscript that's describing this method has been submitted to Annals of Applied uh, Statistics. 
And so uh, I imagine that we will refine the model and then finally release the data to the community. So the short answer is yes, the data is not available, but we will publish them in the future. Any time frame on that? Um, so hopefully by the end of this year, yeah. If you have a particular event that you are interested in, you can contact us. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I think that's actually all the questions that we have, uh, but that doesn't mean anything bad. It means it was a wonderful talk. It was very clear, very detailed and explained everything very well. Uh, we thank you again for accepting our invitation and giving the talk. Uh, we thank everyone for joining. Please do join us again next week at the same time uh, to listen to Alex closer. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you everyone for calling.